I know I've been doing a funny thing, a strange thing, not a funny ha-ha thing, but a funny strange thing, because I've, I've uh, been trying to prepare us for Easter, so I haven't really been talking about the cross. I've been talking really indirectly about the resurrection, because I would like to kind of prepare us this year, because there's really, um, there is, um, there's a tremendous uh, resistance that we have uh, to embracing the resurrection uh, because it's weird. On Easter Sunday, we're going to claim that this guy who was crucified, uh, tortured, tortured to death, tortured almost to death before he even got to the cross and then continued to be tortured until he died, that um, sometime during the next three days, that his body was raised from the grave. Uh, I suppose when I was a child, I saw him as kind of uh, getting up and walking out of the tomb. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, I have more understanding. We grow in understanding as we go through the years, I hope, and I've had plenty of years to grow in understanding, uh, as you all can see. And I, uh, what, what actually happened was somehow the, the body, the physical body, disappeared from the tomb and it wasn't there anymore. And preaching the gospel is really preaching this strange story and encouraging people to uh, believe it. Because after all of these years at looking at the gospel and studying all kinds of experiences of God, I have come to believe in a very real resurrection. In fact, to me, <laughs> it seems obvious. In fact, God seems obvious. I have a dear, dear friend who's an atheist. One of my closest friends, he's an atheist. I've known him most of his life. I've known him since he was a kid. Now, how somebody who has heard me talking to them since they were a kid could turn out to be an atheist, I have no idea. So it, it must not be, uh, I have not been entirely successful with this kid who's no longer a kid, but he has a high level of resistance to uh, the truth of the gospel, high level. Um, and the books he reads uh, are all books which reinforce his understanding of things. Let, let me share some scripture with you today. It's a wonderful piece of scripture. And it's all about this, uh, it's all about this extraordinary resistance to the truth. Uh, this is from the ninth chapter of John. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples said to him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the Jewish people believed at that time that all illness was a result of sin, that if you were ill, you had sinned, and God had punished you with this illness. And uh, Jesus, in more than one place, rejects this understanding of illness. And Jesus said, neither this man nor his uh, parents sinned, uh, but this happened so that the works of God may be fulfilled in him today. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some uh, mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. And he said, go, uh, he told him, and go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. And uh, this is what the man did. And uh, he came away uh, able to see this man born blind. Now, his, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some said yes, and others said no, he just looks like that man. And the man himself said, yes, I, I am the man. All right. And... Um, they said, well, how did this happen? And the man said that this fellow called Jesus 
took some mud and put it on my eyes and he told me to go and wash in the pool of Siloam and I went and I washed and now I can see. And when the man said this, they asked him uh, where he was and he said, I don't know. <laughs> well, then they brought the Pharisees to the man who, the man who had been blind, they brought him to the Pharisees and uh, now the day on which Jesus had uh, done the healing was the Sabbath, and therefore the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight, and the man said to them, uh, I, I, he replied, and I washed and now I see, he said he sent me to the pool of Siloam, etc. Now the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned to the blind man, what have you to say about it? And uh, it was you whose eyes he opened and the man replied, he is a prophet. Okay, well, they still weren't satisfied. Talk about that high level of resistance. So they called in his mom and dad and said, uh, is this your son uh, and was he born blind? And they said, yes, this is my son and he was born blind. And they said, how did he come to see? And they said, they were really a little afraid of the Pharisees and didn't know what to answer. They said, well, he's of age, you ask him. He's old enough to answer. So they called the boy in again, or the man, and they asked him again. And he said, I've told you over and over uh, about this Jesus who told me to do this, and I did this, and now I can see. And uh, he said, why do you keep asking me? Do you also want to be his disciple? And they got mad, and they threw him out. And Jesus heard they had thrown him out, so he came to the man himself and uh, spoke to him again. Oh, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. This is the way people behave. We can have a high level of resistance, especially to something that's, that's new. Uh, I came across, uh, uh, I have a printer that's supposed to, where the ink is supposed to last forever. Uh, with me, it only lasts three days um, because I'm always running off articles that I think will be useful when I preach my sermons. And uh, uh, here's one that says, uh, NASA's James Webb Telescope spotted a strange 13 billion year old galaxy that should not exist, okay? Should not, should not exist, and yet it is there. What they say is no galaxy is larger than the Milky Way, by the way. Uh, the Milky Way, by the way, is where you live. If anybody, if you get lost and, and, and you're looking for your home and somebody says, where are you? Milky Way, remember that. <laughs> we live in the, in the Milky Way. That's the general neighborhood of where we live. Well, anyway, uh, this galaxy is more developed than it is supposed to be because uh, it's not supposed to be that developed and that old. That means, that means it became highly developed pretty quickly, uh, which tells them that their whole understanding of how galaxies form is wrong. Now something's got to give. They can't deny that the galaxy is there because they can see it and they can't get rid of it. So as scientists, they're going to have to change their ideas and they're gonna to have to say, well, I was wrong all along. And that's very difficult for people to say. Well, here's one reason I'm talking about this today. Because it goes on. In 1978, I was in Walden Books, I know brings back memories. That's back when we had bookstores and borders and 
Barnes and Noble was around then. Now there's only Barnes and Barnes and Nobles. Uh, I was in Walden Books at uh, the big uh, and prosperous Six Flags Mall. <laughs> Don't look for it anymore. <laughs> the world do change, do it not. And I was in Walden Books, and I was just rummaging through the religion section, as I am wont to do. And I came across this book uh, called The Shroud of Turin, The Burial Cloth of Jesus Christ. And uh, I started reading it. And I thought, what a strange book. And it's full of all of these pictures. And, uh, well, let me tell you how the book begins. Uh, with uh, these words. On the face of it, the very idea that the linen cloth whence Jesus Christ was wrapped in the tomb should have survived to this day would seem impossible. Well, it does seem impossible, doesn't it? Okay, it seems impossible to me. It demands even more of the human credulity that the cloth bears a photographic likeness which would seem to be that of Jesus as he lay in the tomb, a photographic likeness representing Jesus at the very moment of the resurrection. Yet, it is on the evidence for these things that this book has been written and is filled with pictures. And I stood there in the aisle. I was just transfixed because I had never heard of the shroud. Let me tell you something, too. Unless you are Catholic, we have one person. There may be more who may have been Catholic. You also had never heard of the Shroud before around 1978. Because uh, it was about that time that a group of scientists, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them, were allowed to converge on the shroud called of Turin because it's in the cathedral in Turin and to study it extensively from a scientific perspective. And they studied everything about it and they came to a remarkable conclusion that it was in fact the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, and it wrapped him when he laid in the tomb. By the way, did you know that we actually know where that tomb was? Uh, they've been restoring the, um, I forget what they call it. It's kind of a monument built over what was believed to be the tomb of Christ in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. Uh, which is the one where uh, Constantine's mama, uh, 300 years after Jesus, uh, was told the, the, the crucifixion had, and burial had taken place. And um, there, was a, there was actually a, a, a temple of some kind built over that, probably deliberately. And uh, they took the temple down and built the church with the tomb and also Golgotha inside this same large church. Brian can tell you all about that because uh, he's, he's been there and seen all this. Well, they, they, re they restored the tomb uh, in the last uh, couple of years and they dug down and they found what they believe was a first century piece of slab, the very one on which Jesus had laying in the tomb, the original thing. So evidently, Christians are pretty good about holding on to stuff. 
I know I am. I've got everything I ever had. <laughs> Including things that have no value. But these are things that have value, that had value to them. Well, well anyway, I, I took the book home. I read it all in one evening. And then I took it over and put it on a shelf in my room. I turned out the lights and I went to bed. But the book had made me feel kind of creepy. Uh, and I had placed it on a shelf with this image looking at me toward my bed. I thought, well, it's, that's stupid. Jesus sees you anyway. What did I do? I got out of bed and went over to the bookshelf and laid it down flat so that my blessed Lord would not see me so clearly that night and would have to use his usual methods and could not look at me through the face on this book. I was convinced actually. And let me tell you something, I have remained convinced. Yes, even after the carbon 14 dating of uh, 1978, in which uh, the, at the British Museum, they were one of the places doing the dating, they so triumphantly put those dates from the Middle Ages on the board and then put a, an exclamation point after it saying, we've solved this problem. That's an, that's an old uh, piece of cloth that has no meaning whatsoever. And they thought they were done with it. But unfortunately, what had happened is scientists had gotten involved and the scientists who had been involved were still saying, no, we know more about the cloth than you do. That's all you know about it because you have a high level of resistance, these are my words, to this cloth being real because if the cloth is real, then Jesus actually was raised from the dead and there are a lot of people in the world who cannot have that and don't want it Just for fun, I went to one of my college professors. He wasn't there when you were there, Mary. He was there many years ago. Very distinguished professor and a wonderful teacher. And uh, after the semester was over and all the grades already turned in, I worked up the courage to go into him, up to him and said, uh, Dr. So-and-so, uh, what do you think of the Shroud of Turin? And he, he became actually angry and he said his first words are etched in my memory that old rag now here is something that if someone had just recently dug it up somewhere it would be the greatest archaeological find of centuries it's our chief source of information about Roman crucifixion That old rag, he said. I remain convinced. You know why? Let me see. What time is it? It is 1140. I've got time to tell you this. Let me tell you why. In all of this whole world, in all of the world, actually, I think I can say this. In all of our extended home, the Milky Way, and even on that galaxy that I recently discovered, I promise you there is not a single other object like the Shroud of Turin. There is no other image on a piece of cloth like the Shroud, number one. Number two, it cannot by anyone in this universe or the next one be reproduced. It cannot be. In fact, there's a Jewish guy in England who has made a couple of films on the shroud, one before the carbon dating and one after, who, because of the shroud converted to Christianity, said recently, I will pay one million dollars to anyone who can tell me how that image was formed and who can make another one. If, you, if, if someone was smart enough in the Middle Ages, and they were just as smart as we are, to make the shroud, then I want you to make another one now. You can use anything. You can build a whole machine, build a computer, do what you want to do, and, and, and create, recreate that image. And of course, there is no one in the world who can recreate that image. Now, what science is working on now, the scientist is trying to figure out what in 
indeed did go wrong with the carbon dating of 1978. Tomorrow night, I'm going to see a nuclear physicist who thinks that he has figured out why there is an extra amount of carbon in the shroud. Is he right? I don't know. Will I be able to tell from listening to him? Probably not. You, you, you may not guess this, but I don't know a lot about nuclear physics. <laughs> He's going to be able to get over my head pretty quickly. But what I do know is when I look at that, I still got the same feeling. I'm looking at the very one who gave his life for us on the cross and who rose again so that we can have Easter. And I'm going to stick by that because the evidence actually is overwhelming and also that's exactly, I think, the way God would work. He has given us this world sufficient evidence to know that he is real, that Jesus is Lord, and that you and I are loved. And when this one told us, I'm going to be with you always, he meant it. And today we're going to meet him at this table, his table. It is not, it is not anyone else's. And we are the guests, and we are going to meet him and touch him in the bread and in the juice. Not play like, but for real. And when we get to Easter this year, I want you to know when we say hallelujah, we have more than enough reason. Join me in prayer. Dear gracious Lord, we are before you now and we come humbly to your table. Not because we have been what we should be, but just because you love us. And whether we feel it or not, we are forgiven just as we are. Amen.